thank you all so much for being here. Uh, just a show of hand, how many people here uh, heard about Kubernetes? Okay, okay, very good. Just about everyone using Kubernetes? Okay, uh, some, some of the people. All right, cool, very cool. So that's, that's good for me to set the context of um, a little introduction I, I'm going to do, and then I'm going to jump into the more sophisticated use cases. My name is Ray. I'm a developer advocate for the Google Cloud Platform. What that means is that uh, I've been a, I'm an engineer. I've been an engineer for a very long time. I've been in, this, in the industry for about 15 years now. And, uh, and now I like to bring some of the latest and greatest technology that Google has to offer, either in the cloud or in open source technology that we have, to the developers all over the world. And if you have any questions, any questions at all, uh, please, please let me know on Twitter at Satanism. And um, aside from being an engineer, uh, I've been, you know, a lot of, I've been doing a lot of different things. I've been architect, I've been a project manager, uh, all the things in the technology industry. But from, aside from technology, I also love to travel. I love to travel and take photographs all over the world. And you can find some of my photos on my Flickr.com uh, account as well, under the name Satanism. All right? How many people know what Satanism means? It's actually a real word. No? Yeah? It actually means lead poisoned. Now, that just means you have too much lead in the body and um, you get sick from it. But, but that's not why I chose it. There's, there are other reasons for it. If you'd like to know, just uh, come and talk to me after, uh, after the session. Okay? Cool. So, very brief introduction to Kubernetes, and we're going to jump into the, just the demos and just show everything, like the workflow that I use to go from uh, my laptop development environment all the way to uh, to the, the cloud deployment. So Kubernetes was made, uh, initially made by Google. It was initially open sourced by Google. And uh, it was made, designed to run and orchestrate containers at scale. And basically, we had our internal system called the Borg that we used to orchestrate all of our processes uh, and all of our applications inside of Google. And some of the people from that same team created Kubernetes, open sourced it to orchestrate just containers. And now it's a very vibrant community, right? It's uh, now owned by the Cloud Native Foundation. So it's not owned by Google anymore. It's owned by you know, a lot of stakeholders. And it's been very actively developed. And there's so much community participation right now that uh, you know, there are actually more committers, more contributors than people from Google ourselves. So this is really, really good. It's self-sustaining. Uh, the beauty of Kubernetes is that it actually runs in different environments. It runs in different cloud environments, on different on-premise on environments. Or even for me, I run Kubernetes on a Raspberry Pi cluster. You can actually do that as well. And that's a lot of fun to do. 100% open source, and it's written in Go. At the heart of it, this is how it works, right? If you have a Docker container, or if you have any other kinds of container that you want to run in a cluster of machines, what do people do? Uh, I have heard real stories. Some people, when they, you know, they have these container images that they want to use to deploy to multiple machines, they actually SSH into the machines, and they say, Docker run. Okay? So they SSH into all of the machines. But what, what if you have more than 10 machines? We're like, yeah, well, we script it. Right? So they scripted the whole thing, like, oh, log into each of the machines and do Docker run. right? And then it's like, well, what do you do when the, the instance dies? What do you do when the application goes away and you need to restart it? Well, you have to fix it manually. So Kubernetes can take care of a lot of these things for you automatically. And the heart of it is how, how it works, right? How it works is that, well, first of all, you push the container image into like a registry. If you're using Docker containers already, right, we do this all the, day, all the time. We push it into a registry. It could be a private registry. It could be a, you know, just a, the public registry. And then we can write a configuration file of some sort that describes how I want to deploy this application into my cluster. When I say describe how, I really mean I need to declare what the end state should look like. Right? I'm, not saying, I'm not saying go to machine A and B and do the deployment you know, through a sequence of different steps. In this configuration file, all you need to say is one image you want to run and how many instances do you need. And then it's going to be sent to the Kubernetes master node. And behind the scenes, there's a scheduler that will read this configuration, read this de declaration. Right? The declaration says, I need to run this backend. I need two instances. The scheduler is going to wake up periodically and say, oh, 
okay, I got, I got to schedule two of these backing instances, but I have none, I have zero right now, what do I do? The scheduler will then go ahead and check with all the machines to see if they have enough capacity to run some of these applications. And if the machine says, yes, I can run this, then the scheduler will say, okay, why don't you go ahead and start, you know, start this Docker container, you know, do the Docker run and everything else. And then the application gets scheduled onto the machine. Now we can do this you know, across the entire fleet of cluster, um, the nodes in the clusters. Now Kubernetes, uh, the latest version of Kubernetes can control up to 5,000 nodes, 5,000 machines in a single cluster. That's quite a lot, that's a lot of computing power in a single cluster, right? And it doesn't matter how many machines you have, the way that you deploy, the way that you scale the application is exactly the same. Okay. All right. So I'm going to do a little demonstration today uh, with, um, with a demo application. Uh, this is a very simple app. It's got a front end and a back end, right? Basically, when you click on this app, I'm going to show you. When you, when you oh, what did it is? Yeah, there we go. When you click on this app, uh, it's very simple. Uh, all it's going to do is to say, say something back to you, okay? So it's kind of like a fortune cookie, except it's kind of nice. Yeah, don't panic. And say hello, right? Don't panic. Stay calm, right? It's uh, a way to remind me not to get nervous when I'm speaking uh, at a conference, all right? So it's very sp simple and straightforward. Um, and it just makes this API request to the back end and something returns a string back. Now I'm gonna show you uh, in the next uh, 40 minutes or so, I'm gonna show you from how I can de de develop this application and deploy it into a local environment on my own laptop. I can test everything. And then I can deploy using Kubernetes to another environment that's more production ready like a cluster of machines. And then we're gonna go beyond that and say, well, what if your application, what if your system is a global system? What if you have users all over the world? Then running your services, running your app in a single region, in a single data center is no longer enough. You may actually have to run your application, run your services across the world, across multiple regions. And to do that, we're going to be provisioning multiple clusters. Each of these Kubernetes clusters will be running in a different region, and then we can see how we can control all of these clusters. We we'll say potentially, you know, each cluster having thousands of machines, we can see how we can control all of them through a single federation control plane. So I'm gonna start off, you know, from my laptop first. And the, the best thing that you know, people, the, the most frequently asked question that people ask me is that, well, how do I get started? How do I start trying Kubernetes, right? Well, there are multiple ways to do it. If you like cloud, you can go straight to a cloud account and you can provision a Kubernetes cluster with multiple machines. Uh, for example, on Google Cloud, you can just go and click a button. You can give me like three machines uh, in the cluster and it will provision everything for you and things just start running. If you don't want to do that, right, if you just want to do everything locally, then the best thing I can recommend is using Minikube. Okay. Anyone here have heard about Minikube? Or, yeah, a few, a few people have heard about it, right? So Minikube is just a VM image or it's a little command line utility that you can run locally. And then once you start Minikube, it's going to download the VM image for you. And then once you start the VM, it's going to start off Kubernetes in a one node cluster setup. So what that means is when you start this Minikube instance, it starts the VM and you get one node and you can start deploying application into it. Now, I'm going to um, go ahead and uh, do a few um, uh, image builds here. So first of all, if I say uh, I already started Minikube, so the way you start it, just say Minikube start, it's going to provision the VM for you automatically. Once it started, I should be able to see the status and I can see that this is running right now. Now what I can do next is to um, potentially um, get my Docker environment, right? Because in this Minikube VM, it also comes with a Docker daemon as well. What that means is when I'm doing my Docker builds, I can build directly into this Docker uh, daemon that's running inside Minikube. And this is really nice because if you do it this way, when you build the image, it will already be on the Minikube VM. You don't have to push it anywhere else uh, separately and wait for it to pull, it'll just build directly in the VM so that when you started with Kubernetes, the image is already there. You don't have to wait extra time to download it. And the really easy way to use the Docker environment in Minikube is just simply set the environment to variable. And now 
when I do a Docker PS or Docker build, this is actually talking to the Minikube instance. Okay. So I can go ahead and build a few um, few of my backends and front end. So here is the front end code. I actually wrote this in Go. Um, but it doesn't really matter what you what you write the application in. At the end of the day, it needs to be a container, right? So I'm going to build this uh, front end. Ooh, that's a little too fast. Hopefully that works. And I'm going to go to the back end. I'm going to also do the build as well. So I'm going to say uh, this is the button masher back end. Okay. So huh, they both run really fast. All right, we'll see. See, when things go really fast, you just don't know whether it's going to work or not, right? It, it, it could have failed and you just don't know. All right. So now I have two images. And now if I go to Docker image, uh, Docker images, there we go. And if I scroll up, I should be able to see my, uh, my button masher back end and the front end. And one of them should be V1 and V2 and all that, right? So it's already there. Now I can actually just run this in my local Kubernetes environment very, very easily. Now, the easiest way to run a container in Kubernetes in a cluster or in any of the Kubernetes installation is by using the kubectl run command. So I can do something like uh, kubectl run. Uh, let me find the, the one. So here I can say kubectl run an application. I can name this application whatever I want. And then I can specify the image that I want to run, which is the image which I just built. Now, notice I haven't needed to push the image out to a registry. That's because it's really built directly on this content, uh, on this Minikube machine. And I can give it a few labels. Um, so you can just label things with key value pair. Uh, this is really nice for you to go back and you know, do a query. You can find out what's actually running on my machine, what's actually running in the cluster. So I'm going to go ahead and deploy my backend. So I'm going to do kubectl run and uh, deploy the backend. Oh, wait a second. So I don't know what just happened, but it ran somewhere else. I'm going to go ahead and remove it from wherever it ran. Uh, one thing I forgot to do was to make sure that my Kubernetes command line, when I'm using my kubectl command line to do this deployment, I needed to make sure it's actually talking to my mini kube instance. Now, in a, in a single Kubernetes command line, you can actually connect to multiple clusters. Every time you create a new cluster, you need to get the credentials and also the endpoint for the cluster so you know which one to connect to. And um, Minikube will actually set it up for you automatically, and this is known as a context. So for example, currently on my machine, I have many, many different contexts. Each one of these contexts correspond to a cluster of machine that's managed by Kubernetes right now. Okay. So for example, I have, um, I have a, this is one of the clusters I use for demos, uh, for, for Pies. I've got a context for Raspberry Pi, for example. If I'm a cluster, that's the context I will be using. Uh, so what I really needed to do is to make sure I'm using the context that uses Minikube. So I can use uh, config and can say use context. And I'm going to use the Minikube context, okay? And now, hopefully, if I do the run, it will be able to start my container for me. Okay? Now, even though this is just one node, that is perfectly fine because um, in Kubernetes, it doesn't really matter how many nodes you have. The way you deploy and manage is always the same. Right? So now I got one application up and running, one instance, and uh, it's controlled by Kubernetes now. And I can actually scale this if I want to. So I can say deployment scale. Right? I can say deployment uh, button masher backend. I can scale this up to, say, two. Let me just do that. Again, Kubernetes will say, oh, well, how many do I have right now? I got one instance. Well, let me have two instead. And it's going to find a machine in the cluster to start up another instance. Now, because this cluster only has one machine, so every one of these instances is running on the same machine at this very moment. And I can go ahead and deploy the, um, the, the front end exactly the same way. So I'm going to say uh, kubectl. Oh, sorry, kubectl run. Let me see if I can find the, the front end. So I can deploy the front end as well. And again, it's going to figure out, well, I only have one machine. Let me go ahead and start this Docker container for me. So now I got two. Now notice that every instance has their own IP addresses as well. Every application instance gets their own IP. This is really nice. So for example, my front end could potentially use uh, this IP address from the back end. I can actually talk to individual back end instances if I really want to. 
And if you want to do it that way, then you have to use client-side load balancing, which is something that can be supported in Kubernetes. But what we typically do in this case is, of course, we set up a load balancer in the front, right? So either you use an Nginx proxy or use the HA proxy or something, you set up a load balancer in the front, potentially manually. In Kubernetes, load balancing is actually built in. It's a native concept. It is called a service. And to create a service or to create a load balancer, I can do that from the command line utility as well. And to do that, I can say kubectl expose. Okay? I can expose a deployment, which is my application. And in this case, I'm going to expose the backend. I can specify what port I want to connect to and also what port I want to expose to the, uh, to the outside world. I'm going to go ahead and expose my backend. And what that's going to do is to create a stable IP address that your consumers can actually use to connect to the backend. And once you use this IP, then all the connections will be low balanced and will be low balanced across all of the instances that the backend, uh, of the backend, right? And I can do the same thing for exposing the, uh, the front end as well. So I can do that. I can expose the front end, right? And now it also created the load balancer for me. By the way, all of these things are happening in Minikube right now. This is running on my local laptop. Once I have this, then I can actually see, I can go check it out. So I can say Minikube service. I want to see one of these uh, back ends running or uh, front end running. I'm going to say button masher front end, for example. Front end. And what I should do is to open up the browser and they'll actually connect me to the Minikube IP address and then also forward me to the actual port that this application is listening on. If you notice, I actually never assigned this port. This port was assigned automatically by Kubernetes as well. Okay. So now I'm here, so I got my application up and running, I got my backend deployed, but uh, let me see if this works. Huh, that's interesting. Uh, well, let me show you why. Have you ever been in a demo you just can't wait for the, the speaker to fail the demo? Yeah. <laughs> well, this one was on purpose. Now, the reason why it failed is because if I go to, um, go to networking, here we go. If I do a refresh, if I see a send request. Now, what happened here is that it actually tried to connect to the local, uh, sorry, the, it's tried to connect to API Next in a relative URL, right? We're actually trying to expose the service on the same host as the front end in this case, right? You can do it other ways, but in this particular case, the front end expects the service to be exposed so I can make a RESTful request to it. Now, what do you, people usually do in this case uh, if you need to expose multiple microservices with the front end under the same host? Well, in some cases, you run a proxy, you run Nginx, or maybe you run uh, Zool, right? If you're using Spring and Spring Boot and Spring Cloud, maybe you run Zool, you have an API gateway. In Kubernetes, uh, we actually have L7, so there will be HTTP L7 load balancing built in as a first class citizen as well, and that is actually called an ingress. Okay? So I'll show you what that looks like. Now we actually see the configuration file. So in an ingress configuration, we can actually specify the URL mappings to the actual backing instances that we want to route the traffic to. So we have the front end, we got the back end. The front end is going to be the default back end. What that means is that it will listen, the default ingress back end. What that means is that every time something comes through this proxy, it should always forward the traffic to my front end instance. Right? That will get me to see the page. However, for the API, the API endpoint, I want to just route it to my back end. Okay? So I can do that. And in, in Minikube, there is an add-on that you can actually do this with the add-ons, right? So I can say um, add-ons list, and you actually have to enable the ingress add-on manually, okay? I already enabled it, but uh, if you are doing this uh, fresh, then you have to enable the ingress add-on. And what that's going to do, is going to provision Nginx behind the scenes that will then be used as the L7 load balancer. But that's because we're running locally, you need to run uh, something, right? In this case, it decided to run Nginx. But since that this is already enabled, I can just go ahead and deploy my ingress in this case, and that will configure my proxy for me. Okay, so I'm going to do that. 
And once that's done, I should be able to get my ingress address. Okay. And once that's done, uh, when the backend is, when the ingress, when Nginx is all configured, I should, be, there we go, I should be able to see my application. And now, all the traffic is being routed properly for me to the actual backend instances. Again, it doesn't matter how many instances I have running behind the scenes, the ingress or this uh, L7 load balancer will be able to route the traffic for me behind the scenes, okay? So now I got this whole application running locally on my laptop. What do I do? What do I do? How do I get it into a production environment? Well, typically, I mean, you can go to a production environment and you can do kubectl run as well, but you don't really want to do that because this is a command line. If you have all these command lines, what you end up doing is you will actually be uh, scripting everything again, right? Trying to reconstruct your environment. Now, in Kubernetes, we can actually export. We can actually export our configurations. Uh, from a existing running instance, and then we can export it, and you can use that file, and you can deploy it somewhere else. So for example, right now, because I did a, I did a kubectl run, I can actually uh, grab my deployment definitions. I can grab this configuration file directly out of my minikube instance, okay? So I can get these two configurations. I'm going to output it as a YAML file, I'm going to set the export flag so that it gets rid of some of the, um, the specific information, except the, for the ones you can carry over to another cluster. I'm going to export it into, oh, I'm going to export it into my deployment YAML file, okay? Uh-oh, what happened here? One second. Oh, yeah, I need to do the pipe uh, redirect. There we go. So now I got everything I'm running in that cluster, I just export it into this file. Now I can go ahead and massage this file, I can make it better, I can, you know, for example, for the production environment, maybe rather than running two instances, I can scale this up to two or to six, I can just modify this file and I can deploy it. Uh, same thing, I can grab the service as well. So if I say kubectl get svc, I should be able to see all the services, and I can say, well, let me grab whatever that was configured in this cluster. I'm gonna get the front end, I'm going to get the back end, I'm gonna output the YAML file, and uh, I'm going to do the export, I'm going to put it into services.yaml, okay? Again, if I open this up, I can go ahead and massage it, I can make it more uh, production ready, I can get rid of a few things, right? Uh, specifically, there was one thing I needed to get rid of, which is, oh, interesting. It's not here, okay, yeah. So I think this is ready to go. I just exported all of my configuration from my laptop and it's ready to be reused, okay? Uh, let me just make sure I have nothing else in here that needs to be removed, okay, good. So now I can move to a bigger cluster. And I'm gonna start off with just a regular one, uh, a small cluster of maybe five nodes. I'm going to switch my context so that we can visualize a little bit. So I'm gonna do this refresh, and now we're looking at a cluster with five nodes. Rather than just one, now we have five. And the files that I just exported right here, uh, let me, there we go. The file I just exported, so I have the deployment YAML, I can go ahead and deploy that into my cluster, which uh, in this case I want to deploy into the real cluster now, so I need to switch the context again. So I can say apply my deployment, and that should show up in my cluster now. Now this is actually running in a cluster of my five machines, and now if you look carefully, they also get their own IP addresses, but also every one of these instances is now running and scheduled across your cluster now, rather than just running on one node. It's pretty straightforward. I can also apply the same services as well. So uh, this auto-completion thing is not working so well today. So I'm going to say service.yaml, okay? And I will go ahead and provision the services for me. And this is running in a real cluster now. As you can see, I didn't really change anything. Now the beauty here is really the power of Kubernetes the configuration file that you end up writing that can run locally can also be provisioned in another environment. Now, for load balancing, for example, a Minikube, because I was running locally, it used Nginx and other tools to provision the load balancer for me. 
But now I'm actually running in the cloud in a different environment. My configuration hasn't changed. What I needed in the architecture hasn't changed, but it does know that I need a load balancer. In this case, because I'm running the cloud, it will actually go to the cloud platform, in this case, Google Cloud Platform, and provision a real Google Cloud load balancer for me. Okay? This, the same thing also happens if you're running a different cloud. Right? So if you're using another web service cloud, I don't know what that means, right? it will actually provision another load balancer for you in that environment. These will be the real load balancing uh, technologies in that environment. Okay? And once that's done, then we can actually go, and you can see there now we have an external IP, and we can go see this application all the same. Now this is not running locally anymore. This is actually in the cloud, which is really easy to do, right? So it's, uh, hopefully you see that it's really easy to you know, develop something locally and just pushing it uh, into different environments. Well, that's good. So we went to my computer, to somebody else's computers, right, in the cloud, but what's next? That is just one way for you to deploy your app into a single data center. But what if you do need to go global? What if you do need to you know, have users all over the world and you want to provide them with low latency? What if you want to have you know, global failovers? You know, rather than you know, depending on just a single region, what if that region or that data center goes away, how do you fall over to another data center in that case? So what we have seen so far is that we are controlling multiple nodes in the cluster through a single, what we call a single control plane. This is the Kubernetes control plane. And you can use this control plane via this command line interface, which we just saw with kubectl. You can also talk to this control plane via API. And from this control plane, it's going to go ahead and provision everything for you within the cluster. Now, what Kubernetes 1.5 and on has done is to take this concept and go another level beyond, another abstraction above this, which is now we can have a control plan that can also control clusters rather than machines, right? Here, we're controlling machines. The control plan is controlling individual machines, but with federation, the control plan will be controlling individual clusters. So what that means is now, through a single control, we can deploy and manage our application across multiple data centers, across multiple Kubernetes deployment. So like before, you know, some people, they use you know, Docker run on each individual machine because they SSH into those. In Kubernetes, in the past, you have to specify which cluster you want to deploy, and you got to do the same thing for each of the cluster. Now, with this abstraction, you go through the control plan, and we will deploy this across multiple cloud or multiple Kubernetes clusters, or whether it's on-prem or in, um, in a different environment. Okay? So there are a couple of use cases, right? Well, number one is that well, if you do have a global user base, you want them to have low latency, then you can have the data centers closest to the users. You can control the deployment directly through a single pane of view. You can also use it for high availability if you have multiple zones or multiple regions and multiple clusters. If one of the clusters goes away, well, the federation will actually recognize it and it's going to reroute the traffic for you to the nearest cluster that's still healthy, right? Another really good use case is that, that if you're running in containers, you're running in different cloud providers, right, it kind of avoids vendor locking because the way that you deploy is exactly the same. And now you can run your applications across multiple cloud if you want to. Okay? However, there are some challenges that we'll go into uh, very briefly. If you do run your Kubernetes cluster across multiple regions, uh, one of the biggest issues that you're going to see is that um, when you have communications across region, so like for example between America and, and Europe, you have to go under the sea, right? You have to go over that, um, the, uh, the, the fiber that's under the sea, and there's a limit to how fast you can transfer data across the world. So what we wanted to do is that in a multi-regional deployment like this, we want to you know, figure out how we can actually avoid this cross-region communication as much as possible, especially when you have locally deployed backend services, right? If you have something 
if you have a backend that's locally deployed within the same region, there's no reason for you to go across the, the ocean to another side of the world and try to consume the backend there because the latency is not going to be very good. So we'll take a little look at how that works. And uh, basically, the way that we do it is that um, in Kubernetes, the, the, the service registry or the, uh, what do you call it, the service discovery is also built in. The way you do service discovery in Kubernetes is typically just by using the DNS name. So rather than doing client-side load balancing, you can just refer to these backend services via DNS. And we can use the DNS names to do cross-cluster load balancing as well, because when you resolve the backend DNS name, right, the button master backend, is it can actually traverse upward. It's going to see if it's running locally first, if it's not running there, you'll traverse upward to see where is it running in my federation. And it's going to find the nearest uh, backend services that's, that you can get to, uh, and then it's going to resolve to that IP address, and that's how you can do cross-cluster load balancing. Okay, we'll take a little look at that briefly. Okay, so the way it works is that you have to first initialize your federation. Uh, control plane. And out of all the clusters that you have around the world, you still have to pick one as the, the host of that federation. Okay? And then you can say uh, there's a really nice to use uh, command line utility called the kube fed. And you can use this to initialize the f federation. So let me go ahead and uh, I'll show you very quickly what that looks like. Uh, here in my clusters, in my, in my project, I got two clusters on Google Cloud. I have a cluster on the west side region, uh, sorry, Europe West. I have another cluster in US Central. Okay. And um, I have already created this cluster, but I can go ahead and uh, federate them, right? So for example, I can say um, get pods. I can see um, context is equal to cube fed US Central. And there should be nothing running there, no resources found, right? I haven't deployed anything. I should also be able to do the same thing with EU. Uh, that's EU West, and there's nothing there, okay? So I got two clean Kubernetes clusters spread around the world at this very moment. What I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, cheat a little bit. I usually don't get to do this, but the command line is really, really long. But I'm gonna just go ahead and provision, first of all, I'm gonna provision my control plane in this case, okay? So with kubefed, what this is doing, I'm gonna explain this a little bit. First, I needed to figure out where the host cluster is. Because remember, out of all of the regions, I still have to pick one that hosts the control plane itself. And for me, I'm going to pick the United States in this case. So right now, what it's doing is trying to install the, the Federation API servers and the Federation controller managers directly in my US central cluster. Now, what is also important here is that for the cross-cluster load balancing via DNS, we actually need a real DNS domain name, okay? This, this has to be externally reachable, right? This has to be reachable from the cluster. And so what this means is that whenever I register a service that needs to be load balanced across the region, it will actually automatically register directly uh, in this DNS as well. But how do I actually add records and control the DNS servers? Well, to do that, you can use different DNS providers. Okay. So out of the box, it supports DNS from Google Cloud and also uh, Route 53. Uh, but it also supports a local DNS server like Core DNS. That's a DNS server you can run locally. And what it does is that whenever it discovers that the service has been provisioned, that needs to be load balanced across the regions. Uh, it will automatically, through the API, tell the DNS servers, the DNS zones, to configure it appropriately, all right? So now my federation control plane has been initialized, and this is my federation API server. The way that I talk to it is via the same command line interface, kubectl, and I can, it actually created the context based on the name of the federation. In this case, the name of the federation is called federation, okay? And then I can say uh, something like get uh, clusters, right? And now it's actually going to the federation and retrieving to see which clusters has been federated already. And I haven't done anything, so nothing has been federated, it's empty. 
What I can then do is to start joining the clusters together. Okay. So for example, I can join. I have to join the central cluster again. Right. What I did first was deploy the control plan, and now I have to register myself with the federation. So I can register my U.S. central and EU as well. Okay. And what this actually does is to take my credentials that's able to connect to these individual clusters. I'm going to pass this credential into my federation control plan. And once I've done that, if I say get clusters again, I can see now I got two clusters registered. And because of the credentials, we can actually connect to these clusters directly uh, from the, the federation server. And I need to wait for them to become ready. It needs to synchronize up and just make sure everything's connected. And once it's ready, then I can really control these clusters directly from a single uh, API endpoint. So number one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, create a namespace called default. Now, every cluster already has a default namespace, but Federation doesn't know about it, so I had to initialize it a little bit. Okay? And once I've done that, this is where uh, things get really, really cool. Now, this visualization tool that you've been seeing, you know, we saw it from Minikube, we saw it from a single cluster, and I'm going to open up multiple clusters. So I'm going to say kubefed uh, US central. So the first one is going to be the central cluster. Okay. So let me see if I can boop, do the refresh. Okay. Uh oh. Do I have something here already? Uh, I did have something here already. All right. Uh, one second. Let me move it here. And let me open up another visualization here. I'm going to call it US, um, oh, here we go. I'm going to use the EU West, okay, EU West. Okay, so now I got two visualization tools I can use. So I, let me just go to that site, there we go. And all right, so I got two. maybe that, no. Maybe this is a little bit better. It's a very small screen, unfortunately, so people can see, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that same file, and I'm going to, you know, same thing. I'm going to do the apply my services .yaml, or is it service.yaml? I forgot which one. Doesn't matter. And then uh, rather than deploying this into individual clusters manually, now I can go to the federation directly. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and create this service backend, and that should probably get, you know, from a single uh, API server. Now we can actually, uh, oh, there we go. Right, send it to the federation control plane, and now that control plane is responsible to go to each of the individual clusters and create my services for me, all right? And at the same time, it will also update the DNS names for me, okay? When everything is provisioned, if I go back to my DNS server, in this case, I'm going to go to uh, my cloud DNS. Uh, what is it? Networking. If I go to my cloud DNS server, if I go to kubefed, uh, when it all gets initialized, you'll see the, the entries listed here. Okay? It will take a little time for it to initialize. Context. Uh, let me just use, yep. Yeah, let me do this. Context is equal to federation and get, get SVC. Okay, there we go. Right. So it provisioned each individual services in the clusters, and now we're getting back the IP addresses for these things as well. And very soon enough, we should be able to see uh, the entries getting registered here. There we go. So it was empty before, and now we have a DNS name for accessing my front end. And we should also see that there is a, uh, there's an entry for each of the region I'm in. So this entry is specific for the Europe West region, and that entry is specific to the uh, U.S. Central region, okay? But if you notice here, also, there is no IP address, okay? All of these entries are essentially empty at this very moment. Uh, that's because we actually know what's running where. And currently, we only provision the load balancer, but we haven't provisioned any of the, the application that supports these services, right? We're not running any containers in any of these clusters at this very moment. And that's why all of these IP addresses are empty. As soon as I start running applications, for example, if I deploy my backend into the European region, then 
the European DNS name will be populated with the European IP address. This is all done automatically, all right? So let me go ahead and do that. So I'm going to also, let me just check my service. Yep, everything's up and running. There we go. I got my backend service is there, so I can see the two. Now let me go ahead and deploy. So I'm going to say context is equal to federation. And I'm going to apply my deployment.yaml. Okay. Now, if everything works properly, if everything works properly, this should actually show up uh, briefly. Ah, uh, there we go. Ooh, that was close. Did you see it? So through a single control, it actually deployed to two clusters. Now you might say, wait a second, Ray, maybe you're cheating. Maybe you're looking at the same cluster. Then everything, of course, works, right? Yeah, that could be the case. But, but look, they have different IP addresses, right? That's uh, 10, 12, uh, 2, 6, and that's 10, 24, 1, 8. They are running on different machines. They are physically located in different places. And if I scroll down a little bit, um, oh, because I was running two backend, right? I said I needed to have two backend instances and have two clusters. And what it's going to do is try to do anti infinity. So it's trying to schedule all of the instances across your cluster as evenly as possible. Of course, best effort, right? So now you see that I got. I need two instances in total. I got one in each of the cluster. For the front end, I only wanted one instance of the front end. So it picked one of the clusters to run this front end. And now it's running here on the right hand side that's in the EU. Now, if I actually go and say kubectl, if I say scale my deployment, uh, if I scale my front end as well, my button masher front end, if I say two replicas, okay. Again, I'm doing this against the federation. And federation, again, will do the scheduling for me across the clusters. And it's going to say, huh, I got one instance running in one of the clusters already. The second instance, I need to run it somewhere else. And it just started on the other side, okay. It's very easy to now to do multi-regional deployments with Kubernetes with exactly the same constructs that you can use on the laptop in a single cluster. Now you can use the same constructs across the entire world, which is really, really awesome. Now, I have everything deployed again uh, in a different cluster, and this cluster actually has three different regions, okay? So I'm going to just jump over to a pre-deployed uh, version of this. I'm going to show you one extra thing. I'm going to go here. Now, in this deployment, uh, I also have a visualization tool which you can see the QPS. We can actually see uh, the, the request per second. So if I click on this button, I should be able to see this jumping up. This is as fast as I can click, seven QPS at a second, uh, sorry, seven QPS. Uh, you can actually go to this website. You can go to hcr.ks.io. You can do this button clicking as well. Yeah? So if I stop, oh, no one's clicking. I'm so sad. <laughs> but that's okay. So if you click enough, you'll see, you'll see this um, graph shooting up, right? So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to um, deploy a load bot. Okay. Oh, yeah, somebody, somebody's doing the clicking now. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, nice. Now, every once in a while, I see people in the audience scripting this. They'll, be, they'll put this in a while loop, and they'll script this endpoint call, and I see like, I see like 20 QPS because the Wi-Fi is really slow. All right, but, but now I, I have this load bot. Okay, I can deploy this load bot. I'm going to deploy three instances of the load bot. So what that's going to mean is that it will have one instance running in each of the regions because I have three regions. And I configured this load bot to hit my federation DNS name. Okay. What that means is if there's something deployed locally, this service lookup, this DNS name lookup, should resolve to the local endpoints, okay? Then I should be able to see the QPS going to the, uh, the locally to each of the region. If it's not there, then it's going to forward, it's going to resolve into the region that actually has the application running. So because I only have one instance of my backend, Whoever is still clicking on this, thank you so much. Uh, it's only going to the US 
data, data center, right? So I'm going to go ahead and deploy this robot, uh, QBCTO. Uh, context is called to Federation Cluster. Apply. Um, I'm going to apply this deployment. Oh, this live demo. It scares me sometimes, right? And uh, I'm going to make sure everything is there. Okay. Get deployment. I got like five minutes. This is really cool to show. All right. So, so it's trying to schedule three instances. And oh, there we go. Whew. Nice. So I just shot up to 3,000 QPS. Why? Because each of the load bot is generating 1,000 QPS. They are spread across in different regions, but I have no backend running in Asia. I have no backend running in the EU. So with the cross cluster load balancing, it resolves to the servers that's running in the US. That makes sense, right? Now, what if, what if I go ahead and scale my backend? So I'm going to scale my deployment. I'm going to scale my backend through the federation into three instances. Now watch, this is really cool. Or actually, you know what? Let me do six. It's fun. I can do. It's so easy. It's so easy to just scale, right? So I'm gonna do. Okay, let me do six. So what that means is I should get two instances, two backing instances in each of the region. Okay, so it's scaling up. Now, if everything works properly, the cross-regional load balancing should kick in sometime soon. There we go. Do you see it? And because the backends are running in each of the region, and now I have locally run backend services. And now the traffic just split. And now I'm actually going into my local instances rather than going across the ocean to, you know, across the world uh, to the US, right? Was that pretty cool? Yeah. And all the same, I can go ahead and do my rolling updates as well. So for example, I can go to my, I can go to my federation cluster, I can change my backend, and currently I'm running v1, I think. Let me see, yeah, I'm running the v1 application. And I can change it to v2, okay? So what this will do is to do a rolling update across multiple data centers. And hopefully, at the same time, we don't really see a drop across uh, these QPSs, right? So there we go, it's doing this um, rolling update across multiple data centers, and it's done. And still, all of the consumers are still connected to, my, to our backends, right? Now, what happened here is really interesting. <laughs> um, when I was doing this rolling update, uh, in some cases, like the Asian um, backends probably got rescheduled to the US or whatever, and now the traffic is split again. Uh, what's happening right now is probably that uh, I only have the low bots potentially running in the US, or I have it running uh, in the, um, the back end running in the US. But um, yeah, that should rebalance itself out later. Now, what I can also do, the last thing I wanna show, is uh, let me edit this, oh shoot, no. Uh, oh yeah, let me tell you what, I'm gonna show it differently. The last thing I wanna show is that this thing right here, oh no, yeah, you can see V2 now. This, this URL right here, it's actually served through of uh, ingress. What that means is that it actually provisioned a real L7 loan balancer in the front, okay? Because remember, this actually hits the API slash next uh, URL, and it's fronted by the ingress, it's fronted by the real load balancer that Google Cloud can provide. And this load balancer is actually a global load balancer, okay? Now, typically, when people do a traditional multi-regional deployment, they expose the regional IPs, right? You have one IP for Europe, you have one IP for Asia, you got one IP for, uh, for US. And then, traditionally, what people do is by using regional DNS or uh, uh, geo DNS. So when the user is in Asia, they look up my front end URL, it actually get resolved into the IP address uh, closest to the user's region. Now, if you deploy this on Google Cloud, we can actually provision what we call a global L7 load balancer, right? What does that mean? What does that mean? That sounds so cool, but what does that actually mean? What that means is when we provision this load balancer, you get a single IP address. You just get one IP. Uh, oh, that's the wrong project. I was like, where did it go? You get only one IP address. So rather than having multiple IP addresses, you have to deal with geo DNS, you get one IP. All right. 
it doesn't matter where the user is, when they connect to this IP address, it's gonna come in through the nearest pop and then route through our data center, through our networks, will route the traffic to the closest cluster that you have that serves this application, okay? So what that also means is hopefully we have enough things we can see. Um, if I go see all the backends, if I go see the front end, yeah, there we go. So, so we can see that there's some traffic that came in, and the traffic all came from Europe, because we're all here, uh, whoever is doing the clicking, right, we're all here. And you can actually see all of this traffic is routed directly, directly to the European cluster rather than the, the US cluster or the Asia cluster. If I actually run a script, if I actually start a VM in Asia and start hitting the same endpoint, you are going to see traffic that get routed directly to Asia without coming to Europe at all. Okay. And all of these things are, are done automatically. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to configure it separately. And, um, and now, hopefully, hopefully, you see the power and the benefits of the federation uh, control plans, right? This is really, really powerful stuff, okay? Um, so we saw the DNS, we saw the ingress, right? It actually provisioned the L7 load balancer, right? Uh, there's so much more we can do. You can actually configure uh, affinity, so you can say, no, nah, for this service, I only want to run, to run in the EU, I don't want to run it anywhere else, so you can configure all of these affinity-related things um, in terms of how you schedule. Now, lastly, lastly, is that you can find a lot of these resources online, so you can try Minikube, you can try Google Cloud, uh, you can find my demo that I just showed online on my GitHub as well. I have all the instructions for you to set it up. Uh, the visualization tool that you saw is also on GitHub. And finally, finally, if you really want to get hands on, uh, go to this lab. I wrote this lab, I leave this lab sometimes, and um, towards the bottom of this lab, you will actually see and get to try Federation as well. And last thing, just last thing, uh, Google actually has a Google Developer Day that's gonna take place in Krakow in September. If you want to get, you know, keep up to date and learn more about our technology, uh, you know, just go sign up here so you can get more information, all right? So I think my time is up, and uh, thank you so much for attending. I really appreciate it. Thank you.